I said to Danny then, I'm going to move here. We're going to start this company and I'm going to do anything that we need done along this journey to have us win that championship. Welcome to 30 Years in 30 Minutes, the podcast that distills decades of wisdom and success into bite-sized, inspiring conversations. My name is Michael Ovid, the host of the podcast. Along with Terrence Gable, I sit down with the world's most accomplished individuals and hear their stories of grit and determination. How did they rise to the top? What is the key to their success? How did they overcome the obstacles that they faced along the way? You will learn all that and more on 30 Years in 30 Minutes. Richard Corain is a senior advisor for the Union Square Hospitality Group, the premier hospitality company that houses a collective of New York's most beloved restaurants, bars, and event services. Richard has co-founded and directed the conceptualization, incubation, and launch of numerous successful businesses, including Shake Shack, 11 Madison Park, Blue Smoke, Maialino, North End Grill, and The Untitled at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Most recently, he oversaw the relocation, design, and development of the company's flagship brand, Union Square Cafe, in his new space. Richard joined the Union Square Hospitality Group as a partner in 1996, following a decade of leadership with the Wolfgang Puck Group and the launch of his own restaurant, Hawthorne Lane. Richard, it's wonderful to have you here. So excited to be here and so grateful you thought so highly of me to include me. Richard, you are one of the most influential and respected restauranteurs in America's most respected hospitality group. How did you become interested in the culinary industry? Well, let me just start by saying that uh, I am on the team of the one of the great organizations um, that could ever be created uh, of people that care deeply about um, caring for others. So my career, um, wherever it started and has gone to, is the accumulation of uh, excellence and um, accomplishment by being on winning teams. And so uh, as much as I am grateful for the testimonial you just gave me, I am, uh, I am a part of, of a winning organization and very proud to be part of that as well. Um, I, I actually came to this in a, in a different way than most people in it. It wasn't by mistake. And, and I think sometimes people start their careers saying, you know, I never wanted to do this. And it sort of happened that way. I never didn't not want to do this. I never saw it as a way to be uh, a professional because the way that uh, I sort of started my life was around restaurants, but uh, you know, my, my grandmother was a cashier at one of the great restaurants in Boston, Pier 4, which was one of the most iconic brands uh, in, in, in Boston. And my uncle was in charge of dining at the White House for President Kennedy. And so I always had this sort of part of me that knew about food and entertaining and caring for others. My mom and dad were, 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 you know, such great examples of caring for others as a way of living. So every day that I woke up, that was sort of the mindset that we had. But my dad was an Air Force pilot, and I knew that that wasn't a path that I was going to go down. Um, and so I said, what do I think I'm going to be best at? And that was a clear a answer for me. It was sports. And I said, Sports is something that I'm excited about, something something I love doing. So I, I watch TV and I read the sports pages, and you can make a career out of sports, so I'll just be a, a, a great baseball or basketball player. And that's pretty much how I spent my time um, when I was a youth. I was little lady, I was basketball. Wherever there was a game, I was playing it. And so that was actually my first managerial life lesson, which is, how do you be a good team member? And so I, I got that at an early age from being on teams. And the ones that won things um, made me feel good. And I had this pride of being on a winning team. And I've always taken that with me professionally. But where the light bulb went out 
went on was I got to college and I didn't have a major and I figured I could play sports in college and that lasted about a day until I saw, you know, if there are nine people on a baseball field, I was easily the ninth best. And I said, well, this isn't going to work for me anymore. And I had, I had two things going for me. I had a mom who had said, you're, you're a unique person and you have a lot of gifts. You're going to have to go out there and find it. And that was the first gift. The second gift was the ability to uh, be comfortable around making new relationships. And I got that because my dad was in the Air Force. So if you, if you look at people whose families were in the military, they moved around a lot. So every year or two, I was in a new school, which forced me to make new friends, which is really being part of a new organization. When you look at it, when you go into a new school, you're part of a new organization. And so it taught me adaptability and it taught me how to sort of try to bloom where I was planted, realizing I was going to be planted somewhere else in another couple of years. And although my sister at the time looked at that as somewhat punitive, like I got all these new friends and why do I have to move again? I was like, great, get to learn new things, get to meet new people, get to see new things. When's the next move and where are we going? So those were two things that I had. And one of the gifts that my mom gave me was to say, I think you might want to get some insight from your uncle. Remember, he had an uh, illustrious career uh, at the White House. And he said, this is very easy. You need to go to the Culinary Institute to learn to be a chef. And I said, wow, you can be a professional chef. That's pretty awesome. And I remember him saying, people will always need to eat, so you'll always have a job. And that sounded logical to me. And so off I went to CIA. And after the first day of classes, the first day they actually walk you around the school and you sort of audit for 10 minutes what you're going to be doing. So I had these 20 minute or these 20, 10 minute clips of every class I was going to take. And when I was done with day one, I picked up the phone and I put in a quarter and that tells you how long ago it was because it was a pay phone. And using a quarter tells you how long ago it was to make a 25 cent pay phone call. And I called my mom and dad and said, oh my gosh, this is the greatest school I've ever seen because of all those things I saw. And I said, but I don't want to be a chef. My mom's like, oh my gosh, what happened? I said, well, I just saw all these people who are gifted at this and I'm never going to be that good. And if I can't be really good at something, it doesn't really interest me. And again, my mom being my guardian angel and cheerleader said, stick with it. You're going to find something there that interests you. And I did. Because what I found was I wasn't good at the technical parts of cooking, but I was really interested in and did very, very well in the components of that program where how do you design a kitchen? How do you design a menu? How do you cost out a menu? How, you know, all the business parts of that curriculum was where I went at how to set up a storeroom. I couldn't get out of the storeroom because I loved being in there requisitioning products and calculating how much they cost. And so I said, yeah, there's something here that I really like, but it's not cooking. The next thing I did, which has benefited me a lot in my career, was I found in each class that I was deficient, what I would call the Michael Jordan of that class. So if it was about using a knife and getting knife skills, I watched and found the person who could cut and chop the best And I went over and I said, can you teach me what you do? I'm never going to be as good as you, but can you teach me? And they did. And I found people who made sauces the best. And I said, can you teach me that? And so starting then, that's sort of been my career path, which is I know sort of where I want to go. But along that journey, who can teach me things that I don't know as well as I want to? So I've been getting this sort of professional MBA or doctorate from subject matter experts all through my career, and they've sort of accumulated into where I am today. Wow. Um, Well, it's one thing to go through culinary school. It's another thing entirely 
to grow to be a leader as successful as you are within the culinary space. What happened in between culinary school and I guess where you are now and what steps did you take that truly propelled your career to be a leader in, you know, ways that it seems you wouldn't even, you wouldn't have even expected when you were still in college practicing uh, sports. I look for opportunities to thrive and you know, there, I, I've always looked at career growth in a certain way. There's two paths you can take for growing your career. The first one is you can grow up. So you can start here, and kitchens operate this way um, a lot. You know, uh, corporate, corporate organizations operate this way, which is you start here, you get promoted here, you get promoted here, and then up and up and up. And it's a ladder. It's a corporate ladder. And I think there's actually a phrase called climbing the corporate ladder. And rightfully so, because it's very incremental or there are steps up. And that's certainly a career path that is attracted to people um, because it's very linear. You can say, I do this, which gets me there, which gets me there. If you're going to do that, you need to have, I think, two important elements. You need to have actually three. You need accreditation, which is somebody saying that person's good at this call it an employee review, whatever that is. You need somebody to say, you did a good job here. And number two, you need the desire to say, my next step is up there and how do I get it? Because it's right in front of you and you can look at an org chart and say, this leads to this. And there's one other thing which I think matters a lot, which is you get put in positions of opportunity a lot. And I'll give you, I can give you two examples of where that happened for me. And so, but, but let me talk for just a minute about that. You come to work and things happen, but every so often there's this opportunity for you to do something a little different, which will be additive to your organization, which is maybe slightly outside of what you do, but you do it. And that incremental thing sort of pushes you to places you never thought you'd go. So when I remember when I had first started my career, I was in a corporate training program and they sent me to Dallas to open a hotel. And my job was to train people. My job was to train servers and bartenders to open this hotel and this bar and this restaurant. And when that was done, I'd come back to home base in Boston and I'd get shipped off to the next place. But when I got to Dallas, Something happened where somebody said the person who is the wine buyer and beverage director gave notice before we even opened the hotel. And I said, what can I do to help? And they said, well, we need a wine list. I knew nothing about wine, but I said, here's an opportunity for me to do something. I said, I got this. And so I sort of hunt and pecked it my way around. I got some books and I I went to another restaurant and I talked to a wine buyer and I cobbled together a wine list because I knew how to price it out. I knew how to store it and I got some help with the selections. And the general manager of that hotel said, you saved us. You, you saved us by doing that wine list. And I was like, oh, great. But that was an opportunity that existed for me to do something that elevated me. There's so many opportunities like that every day for people just to do a little bit more and be noticed and contribute and to be additive in a way that maybe they didn't think they could be when they woke up that morning. But back to growth. So there is, la the, you know, the climbing the ladder of success, but there's a better way, I believe, for me. And there's a better way for others, which is to grow forward, Right. So if you're taking steps forward, you're growing and you're not always growing with a title, but you're growing in your head and your heart and your professional toolbox. The example of that is me going into every classroom and finding a master of the task. That's now in my toolbox. I have better knife skills than many cooks that work for us, but it's only because I was taught by somebody many years ago how to do it. But that was a moment of opportunity for me. And so if you look at my career, it's always been, I'm going forward, right? So 
you got to invest in, it's like using Waze if you have ever driven with the app Waze. You, if you put in a destination, it's going to give you three routes you can take. One is the fastest. New York, that New Haven is Route 95. Go right now. You'll get there in an hour and 15 minutes. You can also take a second route, which almost parallels that first route. It's probably about 20 minutes longer, but it sort of parallels it. You're going to get to New Haven pretty quickly, but with a couple detours. And then there's a third route you can take, which goes all over the place and gets you to New Haven in about four hours and 15 minutes. That's my career, which is, I know I want to go there, but I don't have to go fast. I want to go forward. And along the way, I'm going to become hopefully more accomplished, hopefully wiser, hopefully a bigger toolbox. And if my aspirations are high, I'm going to pick up things along the way, which will make me a better professional and better person. Things that you, you pick up are relationships. For a lot of people, opportunities present themselves, but people are unable to identify them. How can you identify one thing as being an opportunity and the other is not? How can you make sure to take advantage of every opportunity that comes your way? I, I often, you know, I, I'm a good student. I listen, I watch, um, I assess things, and I can feel where they're, you know, much like that wine list story I told you, I can feel where there's, you know, instinctively a chance to be additive. And what I, what I try to teach everyone that works for me is be additive wherever you go. Now, additive could take a number of different forms. It could be contributing something at a meeting. It could be affirming something somebody else said, which gets other people to want to subscribe to that too because I'm a good follower. I believe what they say is a good idea. Oh, we're starting a we're starting a coalition here. But to be passive is not growth. To be additive is to sort of try to find a way where you do something which moves the group or the organization or especially yourself forward. And it's part instinct, but it's also part sort of looking around, seeing where there might be a chance for you to add even a little something. Raindrops make oceans when it comes to organizations. That's wonderful. Moving on to the next chapter. How did you meet the famed restaurateur Wolfgang Puck and the founder of the Union Square Hospitality Group, Danny Meyer? Again, the things that you pick up along your journey. Um, I had been in New York for many years when I was younger. Um, and I had gotten to a point where I had said, I did my New York thing. I'm done with New York and I'm never going back to New York. I'm going to check that off the list because California is really where I want to be. The climate, I love the, you know, the American foods revolution was really happening when I moved to California. So. Alice Waters, Wolfgang Puck, Michael McCarty, there was, that's where sort of the American food movement picked up a lot of steam. And I was there at that time. And, you know, that was the place to be. And, you know, the, the boutique wine, the American wine revolution started then as well. And so I was right where I found the most opportunity because it was all happening right there. Plus it was nice weather every day and that didn't hurt either. And New York, you know, is is not California. People move to New York because of the pace. People move to New York because of um, the opportunity to be good at something. If you're a musician, you want to go to Juilliard. If you're a, a banker, you want to be on Wall Street. If you're an actor, you want to be on Broadway. And for many years, I think New York had the reputation of the greatest restaurants are in New York. And if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And I found all this happening in California to be sort of where the, the future was going to start. I think that was pretty true, is look at historically. And so what I did was I had a, a job that was pretty high profile job in, near Hollywood. It was very close to, to Spago, Wolfgang Puck's famous restaurant. And I had done, you know, what I thought was some pretty good work and I had people, and this is, again, this is the next 
sort of managerial leadership life lesson, which is if you can create a group of people who are your advocates, who are sort of adjunct agents for you, who talk about you in circles based on who you are and what you do, that finds its way to people, right? And so I just happened to have a colleague who knew Wolfgang really well and said, you should hire that guy down the street. He's awesome. And it's only because of my excellence and care for people like him that I was on his radar. But it was the power of a testimonial where he said to somebody, I'm putting my stamp on this guy. I got a call from Wolfgang and he offered me a job and that changed my life and that changed my career. And so I was blessed that for a number of years, Wolfgang treated me almost like a son. And being in Wolfgang's world was for me, and you know, that's the highest level that you could get to. I mean, that's the, the mountaintop for all this. And you get to work with Wolfgang Puck a lot. That's, you know, where else are you going to go from there? And much like everything else I've done, I worked really hard and I watched people who were great at doing things. So there are many, many people in this industry who have gone through Wolf's company. I watched what they did. I, I tuned in maitre d's and chefs and purchasers and all of that. I got a doctorate in how to do this really, really well. And through that, I met Danny. I met Danny in the early 90s when I was managing Postrio in San Francisco. We first became professional friends where he knew of me and I knew of him at Union Square Cafe. And we shared regulars, East Coast and West Coast. When he had a regular coming to California, he'd call me and vice versa. And then the more we did that, we became sort of friendlier. And we started to do things uh, or sort of talk to each other more as friends rather than answer professional questions. And that led to Danny calling me in 1995 saying, I just opened Gramercy Tavern and I'm having a hard time being in two places at one time. And I said, okay, well, how can I help? Well, if you could come to New York for a weekend, maybe we could talk about how you look at things and share your insight. So I did that. And the question that I asked him and this, I remember exactly where I was. I was in Union Square. We're walking through the green market and I said, what are you trying to do? And this is another leadership lesson, which is I always start meetings and I always start strat strategy meetings with one question, which is what does success look like? Tell me as clearly and as articulately what success looks like so I can see that in my mind, in your, in your eyes. And he basically thought for about two seconds that he looked at me, said, I want to start the greatest hospitality organization ever created. And literally I said, I'll move here to do that. And we had, and he, he's like, what? And I said, no, nope. but again, I want to be on a winning team. He was able to say the greatest organization ever. He didn't say what all the components were, but he said, I want to go to a place to be the best. Go back to my sports, uh, my sports upbringing. I want to be on a winning team. And I said to Danny, then I'm going to move here. We're going to start this company and I'm going to do anything that we need done along this journey to have us win that championship. And, you know, 28 years, almost 30 years later, we are where we are. I've had four different roles in the company, um, which is, again, another management lesson because for 15 years, I was the COO of the company. And think about that for a minute. You're the COO of the Danny Meyer company. That's pretty amazing. And that is a, a thing that I wore proudly. I, I, I had a conversation with him after year 15 where he said, I think it's time to grow the company in a strategic way. I want you to work on business development. 
And so again, I go back to walking the green market with him. And I said, okay, I said, I'm going to do anything and everything to make this a winning team. Tomorrow I start working on business development. Now think about that. There are many people, not everybody, but many people that would say, well, I'm the COO of the company. And if I change, it's a demotion or it's a lateral move or what are people going to say about me leaving that position? And I was like, like when I moved from school to school as a kid, it's like, great, I get to start business development. How soon can I start? Let's do something great in business development. And so I quickly did that. For seven years, I grew the company. Um, and then he said, I'm having a hard time. The, the organization's becoming too complex. And I need to be in more places, but I can't get everywhere all the time. I need you to be chief of staff. Go back to my agreement in Union Square. I will do anything and everything to make this a winning team. Just like my school metaphor, got to go to a new classroom now. That's called chief of staff. A lot of people would have said, hey, wait a minute. I'm in charge of business development. I got a big title and I got a lot of power. What are people going to say? But I'm moving forward both with title and areas of focus. So I've always looked at it as where do I go next and what do I do to be part of a winning team? And the story really is a testament to the importance of having vision and the importance of being surrounded by winners and being on a winning team. I guess that leads me to my next question, which is what was the vision for Shake Shack? That's actually easy um, because Danny was very clear on that. But just to, to understand that, you have to go back to the origin of Shake Shack. The origin was a hot dog cart in Madison Square Park. Literally a metal cart where we served hot dogs just like they do all over many major cities. Somebody walks up, you put a hot dog in a bun, you put some toppings, they pay for it and off they go. We just happened to do it a different way, which was what if somebody took the the sort of conventional way people looked at, you know, hot dog carts of, we got these hot dogs, they've been frozen, we put them in here, they stay in this warm water and we get buns and all that, which is fine. That's certainly a, a big business. But we said, what if we looked at every product in that, in that application, let's focus on an amazing bun and a, a really great hot dog and fresh toppings. And they're sort of made to order with hospitality. How would that translate? And we had remarkable success by serving a really good hot dog really nicely. And then in that park, a couple of years later, uh, because Danny had been on the committee to revitalize Madison Square Park, we had two businesses there. There's an opportunity to open a food kiosk. And so, you know, we, we, we were given the opportunity to do that. And the original vision was this. It was Danny calling me on the phone saying, I've got the vision for Shake Shack. And I got my pen out and he's like, you don't need it. It's three things. And, and that's how we did business a lot back then. He'd be walking around, he'd call me and, and that's how we connected way before texting and all that. But, uh, he said, it's three things. He goes, number one, it is a, he goes, it is a magnet for the park. It needs to bring people to the park. Number two, every sale of whatever we sell needs to give some money back to the park. So we have a connection with supporting this business and enriching a park. They have to be tied together. It can't be just seen as a for-profit enterprise where somebody does well, but the park doesn't. Let's tie it to that. And number three, it has to be fast. People don't want to wait in line a long time. I'm like, okay, what else? He goes, that's all I got right now. And so that then became what is a mag, what will bring people to that park? And that's where Danny coined a phrase that uh, many people don't use, but it's actually pretty good, which is what is the smartest common denominator? Not the lowest common denominator, right? The smartest. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, What's something that people have a, a, an experience with, no matter where they've grown up, 
or where they've come from or, or, or any, anything that they've done, what's something that they have their own connection to? And he said, it's two things. He said, it's the, the roadside place where you went or the parking lot where you went and you gathered with your friends and you got something quick. And he said, the second thing is the all American hamburgers, hot dogs, milkshakes, and ice cream. And he said, everybody's got their connection to those two things uh, in their life. As a matter of if you're from St. Louis or Idaho, everybody's got that version. Let's bring that in our own way to the park. So the smartest common denominator was hamburgers, hot dogs, milkshakes, french fries. And so that then became Shake Shack. Now, we did not set out to create a hamburger business. Don't believe me. Look at the title of the business. We never said Shake Shack Burgers and Shakes. We never said Shake Burgers. We never said Shake Shack Burgers. We said Shake Shack. It was primarily hamburgers, hot dogs, milkshakes, french fries, but we never set out to be a hamburger business. The public made that choice on day one where they found an affinity and a love for this burger. And we didn't create the hamburger either. We just did it in our own way, which was we're going to create a burger based on different cuts of meat. And here's what it's going to taste like and how we dress it. And people let me know still today, 500 plus Shake Shacks find that that burger makes them feel good. We also said, what if the person making it was a joyful person that loves being on a team? And what if the pe- person serving it was joyful giving it to you. Those components exist in full service restaurants. We just adapted them to quick serve. Like anything else, creating a successful restaurant is all about marketing. It's all about how the public perceives it and especially growing it from a mere stand in, in, in the park in New York to a large national chain as it is today. How did you grow it? How did you grow it? Well, we grew it, and in this, this, I learned this both from Danny and I learned this from Wolfgang very, very early. Neither of, and, and those are the two people I've really worked with almost all my career. Um, I either got very lucky or chose well. I think it's a little of both, but two masters of, of one thing, which is creating community, communities of followers, right? So let's look at Union Square Cafe. That restaurant was opened in 1985. 1985. Think about what happened in 1985. The first URL was created in 1985. You don't think we've changed a lot as a world since 1985, but Union Square Cafe today is busier and more profitable than it's ever been in its entire 38 years. We've created a community of followers. Now, some people who came in 1985 are not part of that community anymore. They've either moved on. Sadly, they may not even be on the planet anymore. But we've kept a lot. We've added more. And we're adding more users all the time because people are choosing to be part of that community based on how we make them feel being part of that community. Same thing with Spago. Open 1985. That's busier than it's ever been as well. So there's something about creating communities. And our brand, Michael, is hospitality. We serve food and beverage to go along with it. But it's how you feel when you're in our communities. And that's plural. Because we only have one scaled business, really, which is Shake Shack, which is no longer part of our company. It's a public company. But that is scaled hospitality that serves burgers. We scale hospitality in different formats. Some look like three-star Michelin restaurants. Some look like barbecue restaurants. Some look like consulting services. Some look like daily provisions and baked goods. But hospitality is what we do. It's why we get up in the morning. That really is is wonderful. There's a Shake Shack right across the street from where I am now. <laughs> um, the, the next part of of the interview is about advice to the next generation. So based on your experience, based on your successes, based on your failures, if you were speaking to somebody in college right now, if you were speaking to somebody who's right out of college right now, or even somebody who's at a later stage in their life, what would you tell them as the 
best and most necessary step they ought to take to prepare them for success in the future and to prepare them for being a leader? Well, I would say if you're still in that university or institution and you haven't finished your classwork, you need to take three classes. You need to take an organizational behavior class or a sociology class um, because that's what you're going to walk into in any organization. Every organization is a daily sociological experiment of getting People from different places, different walks of life, people that see things slightly different than another person, all bonded together to do something really well. That's sociology, how you unite those people and get them to perform at a high level and be proud of what they're doing to sort of have an economic and emotional sort of prosperity from that relationship is what great leadership does, right? And so I would say understand how organizations work and understand how to get the best out of people and understand communities and what makes people happy. Second thing is to take a public speaking class of some form. The spoken word in restaurants or hospitality matters a lot. And if you are able to convey your heart to another person, um, you've got a very and, and to create empathy and care, you have a very good chance of being successful in hospitality because people will feel it, right? And that's a very important thing. And the third thing, and this people often sort of laugh when I say this, is take a an advanced writing course because the power of words matters a lot too. And, you know, the way that the digital world has gone. Sad, sadly, we're writing more emails than we ever did, but the way you have to look at it. So being able to say something of meaning in an efficient and impactful way to get somebody to respond in a positive way is vital. Um, and, I, and I think that that is a very overlooked skill um, as for, for leaderships. It, it used to be that people would have judge a leader by what you say and do in front of them. Now you're judged by what you write. You're judged by what you say with keystrokes. And if you know that ahead of time, why not try to get better at it? Again, go back to what I said before. Find somebody that's an exceptional writer and go, how do you look at creating a three paragraph thing for all of your reports that you know, equals that. I want to learn how you do it. We can take a writing course, but you have to want to get better at that. But those three skills are going to serve you so well when you get into leadership. I would also say in, in a big picture, be curious, right? Be curious. There are new things happening all the time. If you just want to come in and put your head down and do work, there's always a place for that to happen but not on a high-performing team. You want to be curious. You want to grow. Growth is something that you can do just, you know, I could talk to you for five minutes, and we did this yesterday, just understanding why this podcast matters so much to you and what you want to get out of it. I learned a lot. So I grew yesterday by talking to you. But if it was just send me what you want to talk about, that wouldn't have been additive to me. So I'm curious about everything. And the more things that you put into your heart and head about stuff, it, it, it's going to find its way into your toolbox. You need the, the other thing. And again, this is counterintuitive to many people is to be patient. Don't try to plan your whole career out in one day. It just Never know. Go back to what I said before. Put yourself in a place where there are opportunities. You just never know when you're standing around or you're in a meeting or you see something, that curiosity is going to open. It may not open a big door, but it might open a small window. And the small window is all you need to get that air coming in 
And that's going to give you the oxygen you need to grow. And advice to people who are out of college, people who don't now have the means to take a sociology course, take a public speaking or an advanced writing course, what can they do to further develop their leadership skills? They're in a job. They don't have a job. How can they best prepare themselves to be a leader in the future? Well, they should decide that they want to be a leader. And that that choice is an entirely different choice than being a good team member. I mean, if you say, I want to lead a team or I want to be in charge, that's a great thing. And I love being people, be around people like that. But it puts you in a different category because it can't all be about you now. It's how you relate to others. So you, you know, you would have to understand that being a leader is a lot different than being a manager. I worked with some exceptional managers who can make so many things happen and and move variables and control variables. They're as gifted at at what they do managing things, process people. I can't even begin to tell you how exceptional they are. But if you put them in front of a group of people, they would not be able to say, okay, everybody, here's where we're going right now. This is what success looks like. Here's how we're going to get it. Here's your role, your role, your role, my role. I'm going to keep reinforcing things that matter, and we're going to win. They're not capable of doing that, but they're very valuable. Leadership's an entirely different thing. It's a lot of emotion. It's a lot of clarity, and it's a lot of getting people to follow you. And the question you should always ask yourself is, why should people follow me? What is it that I'm saying and doing that if I was that person, what is it that I would say, I want to go with that person? And you can, you know, you can get into a company and if, if you've already got a job and, and you're not feeling that you're growing, find an organization that you think is, is something where you can learn. And again, whatever your next job is doesn't have to be your last job, but it has to be a job if you're going to grow where you feel like you're learning. And it's not always learning based on your job description. It's what else you see around you. Somebody's doing great work around you somewhere. Go find it. I like that a lot. Um, And then the last part of the interview, Richard, is uh, the rapid fire questions. (laughs) So... uh... When did you know that you made it? I haven't. And so, you know, um, that that's the beauty of all of this. The, the, there's no finish line. It's a journey. And I remember Danny and I were walking into our office a couple months ago. And on our wall, we have, uh, James, we've been blessed, fortunate. And I say this from pride. We've won 30 James Beard Awards over our our time for different things, restaurants and contributions and things. So we've got this sort of wall when you walk in where they're all up there in frame. I'm walking by that and I put my arm around Danny and I said, stop and look at this for a minute. I go, what do you think when you see all this? You know, and I thought he was going to give me a hug and say, I'm so proud of, of what we and other people have done. But he looked at me and he goes, well, it's a good start. (laughs) And, and that's the answer to your question. You know, we, we haven't made it, but we've got a good start. And by the way, it's that humbleness that is just, in my eyes, you have made it and beyond. But it's that humbleness that I think is so, so important. And it's, it's very inspiring. And I'll, I'll tell you one other thing, Michael, that I, again, I tell everybody because the hours are long. The work is hard. That's never going to change. Um, but if you choose this business, I chose this. Nobody pushed me into hospitality and said, you have to go do this. And, you know, there are many, many people like us. We choose to be in this business. When the times get tough, when you're short staffed, when COVID comes, all of those things that derail people and demoralize people. Always remember why you got in this business in the first place. You wanted, it gave you joy to make other people feel good. You did it through what you did. You did it through food, but you did it through care. 
you can do that every single day. And I'll give you the final sort of way I remember that. Um, there's one of, uh, one of the great mentors Danny and I have is a restaurateur in Los Angeles named Pierre of Salvaggio. And he had a restaurant called Valentino. I think it lasted 53 years. It, it uh, closed a couple of years ago, but for 53 years, he was on, you know, he was in the restaurant every day. He was enthusiastic every day. It was busy. It was like going to a party every day and he was throwing the party every day. And one day I went up to him and I said, I think he had been open for 48 years. And I said, Piero, you're always like this. How do you do it? And he, he looked at me, he goes, every day is opening day. Every day is the first day I'm open. And I was like, that's it right there. Think about when you start a business. That first day, think about the excitement and how nervous you are to please everybody. And the lights are focused and the kitchen's organized and everybody's ready to do their best work to show everybody we're going to be a great business. That should be every day in your company. And as I tell people, we're a 38-year-old startup. Every day is opening day for us. And if you can think about that and apply that, it never becomes, it's just Tuesday, let's get ready for Wednesday. It's just Wednesday, we got a big weekend coming up. I'm excited. Every day we have zero guests. I can't wait to open the door and make more friends. Wow. My, my father always tells me that attitude is altitude, but that really is the embodiment of that. But that's the beauty of it, you know? The, the only thing that stands between you and that is your own sort of pilot light. Let's turn it up to 10 every day. Yeah. Yep. What is, what is a quote that you live by? Good question. I've got two. One is you can do anything, but you can't do everything. The other one, well, there's actually three. There's one, which is that. There's another one, which is on my wall to my right, which is one of the hardest decisions you'll ever face in life is choosing whether to walk away or try harder. And... You do that in business where you're like, it's going to all happen tomorrow. And then it doesn't. And you face this, should I just keep going or should I walk away and go do something else? We all face that, but those are tough decisions. And you're going to get to a point where you've just got to get competence and clarity. And then the second one lives on my wall behind me, which is work hard and be nice to people. Um, that's, who, that's who we are. That's our business model. Um, that's a winning formula for a championship team. You have to do the technical things and put in the effort and the training, and you got to do all those foundational things over and over and over again and be consistent. The sports teams do that. They practice plays. They, they go through drills. Same thing. You train people. You execute the same way at a very high level. That's working hard. And there, there is an opportunity to outwork your competition, right? Champions outwork their competition. They stay one minute longer. They focus one minute more on something, but they do it. Now, being nice to people, that should be, again, that is not just uh, two words. It's, it, it, it is how people should feel you every day. It's consistent, thoughtful gestures of care to others. So if you have the formula, you can outwork your competition. But how about if you outbehaved your competition? Nobody can compete with you. You're too good at those two things. And you're going to have a recipe for creating a darn good business where people want to be users over and over and over again. Again, Union Square Cafe, 38 years. Work hard and be nice to people. I, w I wish I could be more scientific than that, but I'm, on the other hand, I don't because it's right there. It's, it's right there in front of me every day. Well, wow. how do you prioritize your day? What is the morning routine that you go about that you feel best sets you up for your day? I do a couple of foundational things, which is your basic email, catch up on all of those things. I then connect either by text, phone, or whatever with key stakeholders in my sort of universe. That could be Danny, that could be Chip, our CEO. Um, but I also then, again, I, I've raised myself on a certain diet of put myself in a position to be additive, 
So if you were to look at my calendar, you would look at it and go, this guy doesn't do anything all day. He's got four meetings a week that last an hour. What a slacker. My day is filled from going from here over to marketing. That's going to create something in a work stream that I can be additive at. And I can sit in on that meeting, right? And I can be at it. I'm going to go to Union Square Cafe or Daily Provisions. That's going to open opportunities for me. The, the truth is, after a day like that, I may be behind. But because I built in so much opportunity to be additive in my calendar, I don't have to worry about, I can't stay right now because I got to go here. And the, another valuable management lesson is don't over schedule yourself to sort of prove that you're important. Be, be the impromptu, give yourself enough impromptu time where you can happen into something and help mold something for excellence. Or take two minutes to connect with somebody to make their day better or more productive. If you're back to back to back to back, you leave, you leave and go home and go, man, I got a lot of stuff done today. I'm not sure that you got a lot of great things that are additive done. I can't speak for you, but I can tell you that the way that I wire myself is to be in places of most opportunity. And if everybody needs me all the time, then I haven't sent the organization up for success. And it's all about me. And the last question, I think, sums it all up. You've spoke a lot about the lessons you've learned along the way and how you built your career. What are the three books that you recommend? Number one is Raving Fans. Most important book about building relationships and being part of uh, a business. Um, the, the next one, you know, I sort of go back and forth with folks. There's a great book on... Um, uh, by by uh, I'm curious, Peggy Peggy Noonan on speech writing that that I love and I can get you the, the answer to that and then I sort of have you know a, a book of quotes I I love quotes um, because they're not only inspiring but they're topical for things that I may find to be additive so I'm constantly looking through this. You know, when you, you go to Barnes and Noble or Amazon and you can get the 5,000 most inspirational things somebody has ever said. Somewhere in there, that's going to be additive to somebody. And it's not going to be me saying, do this because I say so. I'm going to go, so-and-so said this. And you're going to go, that just sort of crystallizes it. Yeah. Well, a lot of what you said today should should be in that book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. For sure. And Michael, you know, the thing to remember, and again, I'm going to be my mom again. There's something out there for you all on this podcast. Just go and find it. Find it. And, and if it brings you joy, dive into it and, and don't try to, to map your whole career out in one day. There's so much, there's so much enrichment on the journey. Just keep your eyes open and be curious. You're wonderful. You really are wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for your time, for your words of wisdom and for being here. Thank you for listening to 30 Years in 30 Minutes. Don't forget to like and subscribe and let us know in the comments if there's anyone else you want to hear from.